Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. I was just recently having some wandering thoughts about what would happen if I took a, an endless rubber belt and rolled it over a metal tensioner pulley inside of a large hollow metal electrode, and how much power would be generated at the opposing poles of the electrode between the top and bottom of a giant metal bulb. Haven't you ever wondered something like that? <laughs> no? Well, not everyone has fantasies of being a Nikola Tesla or trying to figure out how the pyramids used amplified low frequencies and a water hammer in order to create free power. But I do. Those are the kind of wandering thoughts that go through my head on a more than frequent occasion. Which brings us to where we are today. Welcome to the Westinghouse 5 electron volt or megavolt Van de Graaff electrostatic nuclear accelerator. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, well, welcome aboard. Now, I feel it's important to point out here that this remnant of a machine looks very similar to many of the devices used during the Atoms for Peace and Operation Candor initiatives that were taking place during the 1950s and 60s. But believe it or not, this device was not only built in 1937, but was fully shut down in 1958, just three years after those nuclear initiatives were gearing up for testing and experimentation. <laughs> What's that? You thought this was actually using a rubber band? Well, it was. But that does not mean it was devoid of nuclear test materials for what it was designed to be doing. And we will get more into that momentarily. You see, Westinghouse during the early 1900s was a company that pretty much held the market as the innovator and producer of cutting edge technology related to power throughout the electrical industry. It was all started by a man whose initial claim to fame was the creation of brakes for trains. Specifically, the railway air brakes using a triple valve system back in 1872, which changed the world of rails and safety in such a way that pretty much the same system is used today and still exists as a branch company of the Westinghouse conglomerate known as WabTech or Westinghouse Air Brakes Technology. The invention of the railway air brakes kicked off George Westinghouse's notoriety and his climb to Robert Barron financial gains in a very short period, all of which led to his money to be spent on experimentation and improving power generation and distribution in the electrical field. Westinghouse is also the unintentional reason why Edison got kicked to the curb and Tesla became the inventor of the power we use to this day in most devices throughout the world. What's that? What invention? Well, alternating current technology versus direct current. You see, Edison's direct current was clean and efficient until you tried to send it a few feet down a wire, and then it weakened and became non-sustainable. Few feet is an under-exaggeration. You could actually send it almost a mile or two on one line in one direction. Tesla's alternating current was able to sustain voltage and amperage as well as current for over 280 miles with no loss in multiple directions shared across multiple aggregators and loads along the way. The level of advantage of AC over DC is truly astronomical. Edison's DC was pretty much good for what it was used for over the past 100 plus years, and that is battery-operated devices, which on another note did not come into heavy usage or popularity until the late 1950s and early 1960s. So Tesla did not beat Edison. He essentially set fire to the man's soul and created a demon that hunted him down and sought to discredit him up until his last days. For all you trolls and pedantic plebeians out there, Nikola Tesla is the reason for current understanding and implementation of alternating current. Yes, I know Faraday discovered induction back in 1831, and yes, I know the principal operation of a transformer were concepts of both Faraday and Henry in 1832 regarding electromagnetic frequency, which led to Faraday later creating the first toroidal transformer. And no, Otto Blethe did not contribute to any of this while Tesla was toiling away with the beauty of his first alternating current motor and other power generation devices until much later when Blathe came along and co-created with Mixa a more efficient transformer, not a motor, while working for the Gans factory who eventually released the ZBD transformers which became the standard for how transformers are created today. 
you, you people really need to get off of Wikipedia and go read a book. Back to this site. So the year was 1929 and a man named Robert Jemison Vandegraaff was sitting in his lab playing with the fundamental particles of matter, which makes sense because, well, he was a physicist, so he was all about Newtonian operation of matter, specifically the branch of physics known as classical physics, with a focus on electromagnetism as well as dipping into the thermodynamic side. While he was playing, he realized that if you employ an insulated rubber belt for conducting an electrical charge from a high voltage source, it accumulates electrical potential greater than the highest amount of charge you were working with initially. The way I like to see this working out is, he, he was sitting at his desk with his wool pants on, which insulated his body, and he was twirling a rubber band around his fingers during the middle of the winter because he didn't know how he was going to pay the bills and was probably stuck with some physics theory that mathematically was kicking his ass for a solution. Then out of nowhere, he touched his atypical 1930s metal desk and received a shock that scared the crap out of him. And being an engineer, lost all focus on all other things and wanted to know how the frig did the static electricity build up to a voltage greater than it was in the surrounding air and why did it discharge in such a fashion? And just like that, the Van de Graaff generator was created. You know, those things your jerk science teacher had in class to make your hair stand on end or even give you a stiff shock from the attached wand. And that brings us, once again, back to this site. Westinghouse was exploring electrical equipment that could produce more power more efficiently, and the Van de Graaff generator was exactly what he needed to fulfill this directive. So, he built one in 1937, except this one was not a three foot tall classroom example. No, this one was a 65 foot tall pear shaped tower, the biggest ever conceived at the time. Inside this device, two 47 foot long high speed rubber belts went up a shaft into the mushroom shape electrode just short of the ceiling at the top of the bulb. Then they filled the bulb with all sorts of gases depending on the experiment, like hydrogen ions or helium ions. The electrostatic potential between the top of the tube and the bottom of the tube caused the ions to accelerate to incredibly high velocities, which would be pushed down a 17-inch evacuated cylinder on the lower 40 feet of the housing, which, by the way, was the largest glass-segmented vacuum tube in the world at that time. These particles were then directed or shot toward different experimental targets, which all created nuclear reactions where a nuclear reaction is defined as when you break apart a single molecule at an atomic level to produce more molecules in the direct release of nuclear energy or the energy that holds everything together. The result was a gamma ray beam that would shoot out and hit a fluorine target that measured the voltage potential between the machine's electrodes. The same type of gamma ray beam that pierced the skull of Russian scientist Anatoly Bogorsky pushing 300,000 rads through his brain, and it didn't kill him. But if you want to know more about that story, you can look it up, and it's a total life tragedy of what befell this great scientist. Or leave a comment for me to do it, and I'll actually do an armchair historian story. To put it more plainly, the machine started with no volts. Then they spin the rubber band around the pulley or tensioner, and boom, five million volts. What is the significance of five megavolts? Well. Your house uses, on average, 120 volts, or large appliances use 240 volts, which is literally two 120 volt lines coming into your home. That means this device was pushing more than 10,000 times the voltage, up to 5 million volts of electricity just by pulling static electricity out of the air. The downside, five megavolts was the wall. The upside, we had our very first particle accelerator or particle collider, depending on what experiments you were doing at this time. Westinghouse then went into the nuclear age before anyone else was even thinking about using nukes for something other than bombs. Yes, it was a particle accelerator, the same thing that is now at CERN, just a little baby version. So this device created the first platform for the steady and consistent measurement capabilities of nuclear reactions leading to the development of the practical application in the scientific field known as nuclear physics. 
1947, the Westinghouse Company formed the Department of Electronics and Nuclear Physics, which went on to develop the nuclear reactors for the SSN-571, the USS Nautilus submarine, for its propulsion system and its power generator, the world's first operational nuclear-powered sub and the first submarine to complete a submerged transit of the North Pole. Further use of this device led to the ability of Westinghouse to corner the market on the capability to use photo fission of uranium, which led to the current methods of how we employ modern day nuclear reactors. Okay, everybody say it with me. What is it? It's a, that's right, it's a hole. And that one's big enough for me to go in. So, I think we're going in the hole. Yeah, let's do this. Give me a minute. All right, so as we come in, we got lots of insulators. I'm speaking softly because there's echo. Here's some of the ring. There would have been three of these insulators tall. Look at that. Do you see that? Do you want to know what that is? That is the top of a cathode for a cathode ray tube. This is humongous in here. This is so humongous. Let's see what we can do safely. Did you want to come in? I have less than standing guard. Come on in. <laughs> Speak softly. Watch where you put your hands. The insulators are made of ceramic, so they're sharp. Cool. If you want to take over that, and I'll go with this. Well, actually, yeah, I'll go with this until I can get over here. There are holes. Can you reach it? 
All right, here we go. We are inside. This is absolutely huge. It's ginormous in here. <laughs> it is ginormous. I'm gonna hand this back to Leslie. Give you the light. And then if you'll take the camera while it's still recording and I will, let's see. It's huge. I'm not even halfway up. went into the hole. So cool. Let me see the camera here. Just really wanted to get you a cool shot of the uh, insulators. And they are not tiny. The usefulness of the bulb went away by 1958. 
and Westinghouse moved on to bigger and better things in the nuclear industry. The site became abandoned and was purchased in 2012 by a group whom were going to build apartments on this site. In 2015, during a demolition deconstruction of this site, the bulb fell. The intent was that the bulb would be stood back up on a new pedestal, painted, and become the center of the development. Then they decided they would get rid of it. But the local constituents decided to inform the contractors that the bulb was not going anywhere and that it represented their childhood living through the golden age of nuclear development. Since that time, the bulb has remained lying on its side at this site and nothing has moved in any direction. The property is currently for sale. For another video on the use of nuclear experimentation during the Atoms for Peace and Operation Candor initiatives, check out this video here. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.